Our next talk is, se is semi-automated workflow for adding software to Easy. And in a change to the uh, schedule, this will be given by Jörg. Over to Jörg. Yeah, thanks a lot for the kind introduction. Um, there has been a short change in, in the presenter. Bob unfortunately cannot make it. So just to be very clear here, I am not Bob. I don't pretend to be Bob. Um, I have been parachuted in to present the, the work which we have done in the two hackathons. One was before Christmas and the other one was, was after Christmas. So I'm the one who is presenting the work, which I've done with Bob and Kenneth. And Bob and Kenneth um, are the two people who also have participated on the hackathon. So who am I? I think that is more or less the last time I can say I'm the doctor. I work for the NHS, but I'm not that kind of doctor. So um, what does it mean? I'm actually a fully trained chemist. I've started working in the lab when I was 15. And I've got the Venia Legendi, that's the license to teach. Um, back in 2010, I realized that's all very well, but it's very difficult to get a position in chemistry, given my, my background. So I switched. Instead of doing IT on the side, I'm basically doing IT, in particular high performance computing, in my daytime. And I'm still being a bit of a mad German scientist in the evening. So this talk is not about chemistry. This talk is about IT and in particular software installation. So why all of that? There's a little bit of an agenda here. Um, basically, I'll tell you about Easy in a nutshell, how to add software to Easy, the goals for this particular part of the project. Um, you get a high level overview, you get the current status. Um, I have decided to show you a live demo. Let's hope that is working. And then concluding with uh, use cases beyond easy. So why do we need something like easy? Uh, if you have been in today's session and indeed in the sessions throughout the week, which were all very good, you notice we have one big problem in common. We have to install software. We cannot avoid it. And as we have quite nicely heard at uh, today's talk, the, the first of the side presentation, that used to be done manually. I started off like that. Um, we all have, unfortunately, quite a heterogeneous hardware environment. So some people have, like I, when I first started, I had six different clusters. That was different hardware. Um, I had two different Linux distributions and in between that, all of that supposed to work. So that makes software installation very, very difficult. And that is basically where the European environment for scientific software installation, up, up, abbreviated EASY, that is where the idea comes from. We, we try to collaborate between various HPC sites worldwide. And the, the goal is to build a common stack of scientific software for HPC systems and beyond. Now the beyond is once you've got a common stack, you can say, okay, you just dish it out to workstations, for example. You can dish it out to whatever suitable device might be there in, in the future. So um, we have here supported, um, it is supported on HPC system, on clouds, on personal workstations, etc. That's basically what, what we mean. And the, the overarching aim is, regardless of what kind of personal, i.e. the system you've got in front of you, um, operating system you are using, and regardless whether within some limitations, of course, you are using AMD, Intel, or ARM, or power as a CPU architecture, all what you as a user, wearing my user scientific hat now, all what you need to do is you sit down, you concentrate on your scientific work and it is working by some kind of magic. And I will tell you about the magic now, at least a little bit, part of it you already have heard. All of that kick started early 2020 by some Dutch universities and the University of Kent, uh, Ghent, I beg your pardon, um, got involved fairly early through EasyBuild, and this is where Kenneth um, and, and the rest of the EasyBuild team comes in. And uh, he put down original plan was to have a good excuse to drink beer together. Well, I think we are 
more than just drinking beer right now, because as you can see, the easy community is now much broader. There is Nordic HPC sites, there is Seacam, there is Amazon involved cloud based provider and the same goes for Azure and there are other people involved in it. And just to really emphasize this and to make sure people understand it, this is currently work in progress. You can use it for testing. You can use it to say, look, this is something I would like to, to use in the future, but we are still not quite there yet. We've made quite a bit of progress. Don't get me wrong here. Um, and I will demonstrate some of the progress later on in the live session, but it's not good enough in inverted commas for production. So you've seen that slide before. That was what um, has been pre presented yesterday. So what is the overall overarching principle of, of easy? Now, right at the bottom, we've got the hardware. So you've got Intel, AMD, ARM and power. And then the hardware itself doesn't do anything. It's a bit dead. You've got an operating system. The operating system basically makes sure that these pieces of silicon are talking to each other. Um, that is within the box or that is outside the box, i.e. internet connection or even World Wide Web if you want. So operating systems uh, are, for example, Linux. You've got the Windows subsystem for, for Linux or you've got Mac OS, just to name a few. And on top of that is the file system layer because somehow all of the information, the bits, need to be stored and here file system is there. And, and what we, we are doing is we are basically going on top of that file system layer with the CERN VMFS. That is one way of mounting a remote file system in such a way that it looks like it is local. So you might be familiar with NFS, for example. Think of, think of it for the sake of simpli simplicity, some kind of NFS in inverted commas, and I'm, I'm waving my hands here, which you can't see. Now, the problem is you want to have software which is running on all of these different architectures, and you want to have software which is not only running on all of these different architectures in terms of CPU, but also on the different host operating systems, which I just have mentioned. So we need some kind of a yeah, compatibility layer, which is basically translating what is done in the software layer, and I'll come to that in a second, to what is available on the host. So for the compatibility layer, um, we are using Gentoo, which is working quite well. And basically what it does is it is more or less shielding the software layer from the underlying layer. Now, if that shielding is 100%, that doesn't work because you can't go into the software layer. So there is some connectivity, of course. Network, for example, is transparent, so that goes through. And of course, you need access to the disk. You need access to your local files. So it is not completely shielded. It's a bit of a weak shield. Think about it as something somehow similar like a container, but yet different to a container. Container is basically one entity. Think of a shipping container. If you want to have uh, more content in the shipping container, you have to open it, you have to put stuff in, and basically you close it. And then you have to ship it again. Now, with the way we are doing it, if you want to add, hard, uh, if you want to add software to our software layer, we just install it. And then it is distributed. So there is no customs, there is no checks, there is no border. It is simply distributed and you can use it worldwide more or less immediately. The more or less immediately is simply, well, if you ingest in say um, at the uni University of Ghent and you want to access it in Australia, I'm pretty sure we all appreciate there's a little bit of lack for the information to get from A to B, but it's more or less instant. So, there have been talks about uh, easy before. So um, Kenneth gave a very good talk back in 2020. And there is also a very good talk done by Kenneth and uh, Bob, uh, easy behind the scenes. There is an introduction to easy, which was done at last year's um, easy, uh, pardon me, easy build user meeting. 
And uh, as I said, Thomas was giving a talk about uh, getting started with ESI. So some of the slides you, you, you will see are probably looking quite familiar to me. So what is the problem with installing software? Why do I need to have all of that fuss about it? Why do I not just say, okay, RPM install or Debian install and off we go. The problem is we are installing scientific software. And that is different from, and um, I'm using that as an example, that is different from your normal um, text manipulation software like um, VI or open office or whatever you want to do. Scientific software does quite a lot of number crunching. So it is absolutely important that it is running with the best speed possible. I give you an example. When I started my job back in 2010, I recompiled the program because there was a new version around. And I've noticed it is using BLAST. The original software package had the net um, BLAST, which is just a reference BLAST. And I thought that's rubbish. So at the time I installed the more optimized um, BLAST, I believe it was Atlas. And I said, okay, I've installed it and, and go ahead. And within five minutes, an email was sent around and the guy who previously installed it said, don't use my version anymore because Jörg's installation is three times faster. So if you are installing software properly and with properly, I'm, I'm, I mean, really on focused on that hardware, you see a benefit. The benefit is it is much faster and I'm pretty sure all of you scientists will appreciate that. Another problem here is it requires quite a lot of dependencies. So if you have um, a very simple software, all of that might be just one program to install, maybe one dependency. If you've got packages like TensorFlow, for example, or the AlphaFold, which was in the previous talk, or CP2K, there are an awful lot of dependencies. And I'm not only talking about dependencies on how to actually compile the software, because most of the time we compile it from from source code. I'm also talking about dependencies to other pieces of software or libraries for interconnection. MPI, for example, comes to mind or put in here what, what you can do. So if you install scientific software, all of that takes time. So yes, I can, can automate quite a bit, but um, all of that is, is very complicated. And as we've heard in the two side talks today, it takes quite a lot of time and you really have to pay attention to what you're doing and you really have to test your installation and it takes quite a lot of time. And I dare to say, it doesn't make any sense in a modern world that I'm doing more or less exactly the same what, um, what Sebastian is doing in Jülich or what uh, other people are doing at, at a different place. So it does make sense to, to say, do it once, do it properly, share it out. And that is exactly where easy comes in. So what we are doing is we are installing the software centrally. We optimize it for the specific CPU micro, micro architectures, for example, Intel Haswell, AMD Rome, um, Graviton, Power, you name it. And as you know, AMD has Zen 2, which is Rome and Zen 3, which is uh, Milan. And I'm pretty sure at one point we have Venice, Zen 4 or whatever it will be called. So it's getting quite, quite big. But we are doing all of that really specifically for the architecture and we try to get, and I, I'm, I'm, I dare to say we are actually quite good at it thanks to the Easy Build project. We, we are trying to get the best performance you possibly could get out of the, out of the hardware we are using. So I, I give it already away. Um, software installation is done with Easy Build, and we are using here in the Easy Project the LMOD uh, module files, which is one of the two um, ways of, of using modules. Again, I link back to, to the both talks which were given yesterday about environment modules and LMOD. I've got no preferences here, just to be clear. And also, as, as I said, we are doing our path linking so we have um, specific folders for, the, for all of that um, architecture. And I already alluded to it, you have to actually 
um, test new software. This is where Reframe is coming in. Again, we've heard to talk about uh, that um, this week. Currently, this is a little bit planned for the EASY project, but it is already there as in this is what, what we are planning to do. So all of that is basically um, what the EASY project is about. Now, the big problem is you need to get the software in there. And um, so currently, we can do it, obviously, because we have software in there. As you can see, there is a list on here. Um, yesterday, Thomas was, um, was telling us about Romax, simply because it's fairly quickly to, to show it. But we also have OpenFOAM, for example, Quantum Espresso, TensorFlow. Anybody who ever has installed TensorFlow know exactly how complicated it is. Um, R, if you want to install, install R and you want to get as many plugins as possible in, it takes some time. Bioconductor and Worf, just to name a few. So all of that is there, um, as we already have, have seen. Um, you basically set up your CV um, MFS system, and then you run an init script, which is basically automatically detecting which kind of architecture you're using. In that case, it is x86 underscore 64. It is an Intel, and it is Haswell. So the script automatically detects which hardware you have, and it is then setting it up for your specific hardware. Now that is quite good on a HPC system, but think about the possibilities. You can give that to a scientist. Me working in the, in, in, in the NHS, which as you might have thought means hospitals, um, I was, Back in 2020, in autumn, I was involved in the whole COVID-19 testing they were doing. And one of the problems I encountered was to get, to make sure they are installing the software properly and make sure they are using it properly. So unfortunately, at the time, Easy wasn't that ready. If it was today, and if we had uh, the, the software in the Easy stack, I simply would have said, give me a second, set it up and said, this is exactly, you do ML, Arctic, and you've got your Arctic pipeline. And these are the various versions. If there's a newer one, you just load the newer one and you can concentrate on your work. Isn't it wonderful? So in this example here, we basically say, okay, TensorFlow, and then we load down some TensorFlow stuff and we can run it. So a client doesn't need to do any software installation which is ideal in a research environment, in particular when you've got, and I don't mean it in a nasty way, don't get me wrong here, when you've got researchers who are not that computer literate, they are more focused on the research they are doing, where they are brilliant at, but computer is for them like a hammer, it's a tool who is making their own hammer. So the current workflow to get software in is quite long, literally long. Um, you're running as a human, I'm, I'm running a software installation script, which is building the con uh, container for the architecture, which is, is there. And then we are doing the whole installation of the software, which takes some time. Then we are basically tarballing it and it will be uploaded in a WS3 S3, um, bucket. Um, then we've got a script which is ingesting this, and then it goes into, at the end of the day, it goes into the repository. So all of these scripts are available. You can, you can try it out. The links are there. I've done that. When was it? 2020, I think it was, or, or beginning of last year, I forgot. Um, I've done it. It's a nice evening. You probably want to have some, some beverage next to you because it takes quite a long time. And, and that is exactly where the problems are. It is too manually and it is too time consuming. If you think about it, and I already alluded to it, for the sake of the argument, you've got the x86 architecture, you've got the power, and you've got ARM. So these are the three main, I hope I haven't forgotten anything three main ones. So for x86, you've got Intel and AMD, and they are slightly different in their microarchitecture. For Intel, for the sake of argument, you've got the latest one, which is Ice Lake, 
then you've got Cascade Lake, you've got Haswell, and you might want to build a generic one. For AMD, you've got Zen 3, you've got access to the cloud, for example, and you've got Zen 2, which is quite widely available right now. So for ARM, you want to build a generic one, and of course, you want to build a specific one. So if you sum up all of that, and I think all of them are mentioned down here, um, you see you get around, sake of argument, 10, 10 different builds which needs to be done. So either I'm sitting there for 10 nights and doing all of that and hoping all of that is working okay, or I get somebody else to do it. And so the somebody else to do it is actually what we are aiming for. The reason behind it is we want to automate the whole process. So if scientists, for example, comes along and said, I need a particular piece of software in, in the easy stack, all what needs to be done is, at the end of the day, you open a pull request on GitHub. How you get there, that could be directly to GitHub if somebody is using GitHub and, and is familiar with it, or it could be via a different web interface from from one of the sides, that doesn't really matter. You need, an old, you need a pull request from GitHub. And as we've got a pull request, and we've seen things in previous talks, so that is not new here, you get automated feedback whether the proposed integration into Easy worked, where the problems are, what didn't work out. There is software which, for example, cannot be built on, on ARM right now. There is software which cannot be built or has a little bit more hoops to, to jump through, to be built on, on power. So all of that needs to be done. So the attention points is we want to have it automated. We want to make sure, and I alluded to that a number of times, um, the performance is as best as we can get it. And of course, security. We are distributing software worldwide. The last thing you want is malicious software in it. Now, I have to do a disclaimer here. Of course, if the original source code, which is coming from the original um, maintainers of that, of that piece of program, has a bug in it, there's very little we can do about. It is a risk we have to accept. Otherwise, we shouldn't use software. And as I already said a number of times, I want to press the Start button, and then I do something else, whatever some, something else might be. And there is as it is said here in the last paragraph, there are a few uh, conditions to accept software. Um, it should work correctly in the easy environment. If you've got a highly experimental code, it will be a bit more difficult. If you've got code which only runs on back alpha, well, hmm, good luck with it. Um, it should be possible to, to do tests using reframe. And um, as I said, the bottom bit is software should build and test on all of the targets CPUs. And as I said, ideally, sometimes the software is not there, but it is worthwhile to say we make an exception here. Um, so it is all doable. So let me introduce you to Marvin. Marvin is the little robot pictured on the bottom left here. Now, those of you who are familiar with English literature, they know, of course, Marvin is a character of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So what we are doing is we actually have in the hackathon, we have implemented the bot as a GitHub app. In our particular case, we were using Python 3 because Python 2 is deprecated, um, which is using Flasks, which is a kind of web app framework. And we are using the PyGitHub which allows us to talk to a GitHub uh, API. Um, that is actually working already in, in a test phase. So we tried it last year. If I uh, managed to open a pull request at that um, particular uh, GitHub repository, it is actually doing an, an event. And the event then triggered off the automatic build. And so some of it is already working. So the idea is you submit a, a pull request. It's triggering off the automatic um, pulling, um, installation of the software. You get some feedback. It is working, it's not working, whatever. The software is built inside the easy build container, but just to inject here, um, the way the script is currently working, you also can build on top of an easy build stack. 
So think of the following scenario. Um, as, as we've heard in the previous talks, we are using, or some side is, is already using EasyBuild for their software stack. They want to expand to it. They want to have their own lo local CVMFS system. They basically could use our script. Um, what we are doing up to an extent is we are verifying that the software installation works. The up to extent is for the easy build um, path I just mentioned. I build the software within an Ubuntu Singularity container. And then I simply run a simple test in a Rocky container, simply to make sure it is working in a different uh, environment. So to get at least completely wrong builds out of the out of the way. And then after the PR is merged and everything is okay, basically pass it on to the next building block, which is then ingesting it into the easy repository. So that was the big quite detailed overview. So the high level view of all of that is a cont contributor. So a scientist, for example, or anybody who is using our cluster is basically requesting a piece of software. So it's opening a pull request. We can use, ideally for easy, we are using um, the files in YAML format, which is depicted at, at the left-hand side. So here the software is um, open phone. The tool chains we want to use for whatever reason is FOSS 2020A. And the versions here is eight and version 2006. That goes to a reviewer simply because I don't want to have my build farm, my software build farm being used for building a World of Warcraft 2 or whatever the latest game is, I've got no idea. So we, we need to have a human here saying, yes, that's fine. Or no, you can't do it due to reason number X, Y, Z. License issues, for example, uh, could, could play in a role here. Now, the maintainer then goes to Marvin, our bot, and says, look, there is work for you. So Marvin takes the work and farms it out. So if you're working with the cloud, like Amazon, for example, or AWS, you can have different architectures. So Marvin takes it and says, okay, here I'm firing up all of my build nodes, and I'll show you that in a, in a bit. And you build for Haswell, you build for Graviton, you, you build the Skylake, and you build Power, just to give you some examples. So the build nodes are firing up. They are building the um, software and everything they build will be put in a, in a tarball. So why do I say everything I build? I don't want to have the whole software stack, which is there in the tarball. I only want to have in there, which is new because otherwise the tarball gets a little bit too big. So, then Marvin goes back to basically the, um, the Git bot and says, okay, the builds are there and they are all okay. That means the Git bot contacts the maintainer, the maintainer looks at it and says, yeah, it's fine, Marvin, go ahead and test it. So we have a build system, say build system X, and we test it on a complete different system. So for example, if we were building in one of the clouds, we could say, okay, as it happens, I've got uh, power on, on site, I test it on power. As it happens, I've got uh, some Intel or AMD on site, I test it on, on one of them. Simply to make sure we are not running into the mistake uh, everybody has done before, it is working on my system. I don't understand why it is not working at yours. We can't allow that. So then Marvin comes back and says, hey, it is all okay, didn't have any problems. And then the PR, uh, the maintainer says, yep, yeah, it's fine, wonderful. Marvin, go ahead and, and merge it into, into our easy uh, repository. So these are basically the ways depicted on the right-hand side that is part for a different, different project which we have done in the hackathon, so I'm not going into great details here, but basically it will be uploading for state for staging. That is an S3 bucket, and then it will be downloaded into Stratum Zero, and then it will be ingested into our easy repository. And of course, there is obviously testing in between here as well. 
So now it is time for uh, me getting very nervous because I'm showing you now how part of it is working. So what I'm doing now is I stop my share here and I will share you, show you my screen. So let's see if that is all working. No, that is not what I wanted. Um, apologies. I need my console. That is my console. That looks a little bit better. So what do I have here? That is basically the site where Marvin is downloading all of the information it needs. The only information it needs to run the automatic build is basically where to find the information. So that is a path. I kick that off because it might take a moment. And as you can see, I've to make sure I'm not mistyping anything. I'm kicking it off. As you can see, we are using Slurm and I'm working on a cluster, on, on a cloud-based cluster that is um, cluster in the cloud. So as you can see, it is kicking it off for a Haswell build, a Cascade Lake build and a Graviton build. Now I'm going now over in that folder there, which I conveniently have here. And if I had done that before, the folder initially is basically empty. It only has the software list.yaml file in there. And the script is then creating two folders. One of them is called scripts. If you look in there, that is very easy. Um, these are basically the Slurm submission scripts. Everybody knows how they look like. And if you go into the, the logs folder, currently you see nothing because the nodes are still getting fired up. So as you can see here, FD means fired up and PD it is currently queued. I'm, whilst that is firing up and is working the background, what I want you to show you is um, we've got more or less a central file which does all the configuration. That's the more interesting thing. That can be optimized or that can be adjusted to your environment. So for example, here, um, the platforms we are using is Haswell, Cascade Lake, uh, Graviton. These are the partitions which are available on Slurm in this particular setting. So I basically uh, define a function here and then I put down constraints. I can put down uh, partitions, for example, cores and the architecture which is used later in the script for a number of, of different things. You can have, for example, something like this. You can say, okay, we are firing up for GPUs. Uh, that same script is what I was using to install cluster on our recently acquired, hmm, purchase sounds better, uh, HPC cluster at King's College. So that is actually not something which is new, that is coming out of the, the uh, that is actually being tested up to an extent. And here you can say, what do you want to install? As I said before, um, you could think of sites which have already easy built in production. So you can extend to that and say, okay, I'm doing it now automatically. We've seen examples before. I'm pretty sure other sites have similar examples. You can say, as, as it is said right here uh, now, you can say, okay, I want to have only easy because I want to contribute to the easy project for whatever reason, or I want to have both. And as you can see down here, there are um, ways of, of customize that. So for example, here, the container version I swapped over last night to a different one. Um, that container is for the easy build. It has nothing to do with the easy um, build. So let's see what the... Um, something I've learned. So that is running now. That is what I was waiting for. I'm going back into my logs directory and hopefully here I see a few logs. So if I go into the um, Haswell out, for example, so what you can see, it is actually downloading the container from Docker. So we've got a container to build uh, the easy build software in it and it is downloading it from, from Docker. Let's see if it does a little bit more. It did. 
So it's downloading it, it's creating the uh, ZIF file, it is starting it, it is mounting it, it is all doing the whole dance for you. And then this is what Kenneth did. Um, you get a little bit of color coding. Um, we're doing some initial checks to make sure we are running in the uh, gentle prefix, which is good. And um, then we are looking into, okay, where are we? Remember that is the log file for Haswell. So we are in the Haswell um, folder or the architecture. So that looks good. We've got LMOT, which comes from the uh, container. Um, we are using easy build. It's checking for easy build. And that comes actually from down here. Yeah. So, um, and from the CVMFS um, folder, we are getting easy build. Just to, to, to emphasize that again. So it is loading the easy build module. So if I go down a little bit, so where are we here? And um, as it says up here, again in green, we found easy build version 4.5.0. The latest one is 4.5.2. There are, are reasons why we are using that one. It is printing out the environment here. I'm not going into that in, in great details. And then it's starting off, okay, let's, uh, let's start off and, and looking for some, some programs. So here, for example, it is um, passing a hook for, for Java 11 and it found it, so it's fine, already there, don't, don't have to do anything. Here we are looking for um, GCC 930 and it's already installed, wonderful, you hear P. And um, that bit here, that is now new in the script, that is the easy, sorry, easy stack file, which comes from the GitHub runner. That is the software list.yaml file I showed you earlier on, and I can show you that in a moment. So if it all was working okay, oops, we are too far. Where are we? Um, that's a problem. Sometimes it is too quick or I'm too, low, too slow with talking. So basically it says, okay, I installed BC2 and a particular version and I extended that last night and I also do setlib. The reason I've got BC2 and setlib, it, it's fast. Whether it makes sense to install it is, is not, it's, it's simply fast. And it is basically uh, downloading it and um, it is checking the, the uh, sum. So it does the whole easy build dance and it is preparing the module and so on and so on and so on. And the way the easy stack worked. So then we are doing the LMOD cache update. That is important because we only want to tarball the software we just have installed. We don't want to install, uh, want to tarball all of whatever is in easy um, already. It is doing all of that. And at the end of it, it should say, hooray, there is a content, there is a, um, a tarball created. Let's see if that is the case. Fingers crossed, indeed, we have our tarball here. There it is on the right hand side. And now you say, hang on a second, you have started off three builds. Um, trust me when I'm saying the Cascade Lake is still building. So that takes a little bit longer. Just to demonstrate that, and then I finish off the demonstration. That's basically the software stack um, YAML file, which is then ingested in, in easy build. And, and that is working quite well. If you want to look at the software a little bit further, what we have, so all what is going on in easy is in here. All what is going on in easy build is in here. And as I said before, basically the scripts which are here are with some minor modifications, the scripts I'm using for the last four weeks before Christmas and up to now for installing software on our cluster. Instead of having an auto, yeah, I actually was using automatic build and I just expanded on, on it a little bit. So all of that is, is actually working. So that, that is, is, is not how well we are thinking about it. Um, it is, most of it is, is, is there. There are some, some minor things which we need to, to look at, but 
it is actually working quite well. So I stop the share here now again, and I'm going back to my talk. Where is it? I hope I've got the right slide now. No, not that one. Oh, hang on, that was the right one. Apologies, I've got far too many windows open. That is always a bit of a problem. Don't do that. So, good. Let's go back to um, present presenting mode, if it is working. Doesn't like to do it. No. Okay. Leave it as it is, only two more slides. Um, the current status of all of that is can be found on GitHub. All of these slides will be shared later on, so you don't have to note on the links. We've got a proof of concept that our implementation of the GitHub app is working. What I presented is part of what we've done in the hackathon. If you haven't been in a hackathon, I strongly recommend it because you learn an awful lot. I've never been in a hackathon and that in December was my first one so much so that in, in January, despite not having much time, I said, I'm doing it. Um, currently, it is building. That was the aim of the hackathon. We can build the software and we can actually create or we do create the uh, table. What we haven't done yet is we don't get the feedback yet into the uh, PR. And uh, hence, only opening the pull request is actually triggering an event. There are some notes of what is what is um, still open. And as I said before, um, this is not only for for easy. You also can use it for other um, for other purposes as well. Why does it say now participants can see your yeah? Um, you can you, you can use it for other purposes as well. As I said, if you're running a local CV MFS um, server, for example, because you want to farm out or dish out um, proprietary software, you want to have highly specialized software. Again, working in a hospital environment um, might require something like this, where you've got patient data, where you've got pseudo anonymized data. The anonymous data is no problem. <clears throat> So all of the software stack is managed via a pull request. Um, you can define tests to verify the installation using reframe. That is something which we are still need to implement. And as I said before, Marvin is there to build and test the installation before we actually deploy it. We obviously only deploy things if it is working out as expected. And we try to avoid manually running easy build. It is fun to run easy build, but I think we've got better things to do. And obviously for the easy build maintainer, it means you've got an easier access to test contributions. That means you can test it on more than one architecture. And of course, um, if it is all working, then you can uh, merge it into the PR. And I stop my share now because I'm actually at the end of my talk. Are there any questions? Thank you to Jörg for the talk. If there are questions in Zoom, then please raise your hand and I'll, and, um, and, and I'll allow you to ask them. Does a tata also count as a hand? Because I can see Lars put something up unless I've got it wrong. <laughs> I take it you like my talk. But what I would like to uh, encourage um, the people here in particular, um, the side presentations, what I would like to see is really the community coming together and work together. What I really like at the Easy Build community is we've got people from all walks of life. That is one of the reasons why I said I'm a chemist by training and I'm doing IT now. I've got a different view of things, how software 
supposed to work and what I expect from software than Kenneth, for example, who is trained in IT, if I got that right. So it is, it is very important to have this really heterogeneous environment because this is when things are really thriving. Yes, there is more discussion, but what comes out of the discussion is a better product, if you want to say so. So what I want to avoid is redoing if things other sites are doing already. What I would like to see is sharing code and, and working together in a collaborative uh, environment. So I better stop now, otherwise I'm getting too carried away. I'm not seeing any questions, so we'll say thank you to Jorg and we'll wrap up this talk here. Thank you for that. You're most welcome. And our next talk will be in about 15 minutes.